is the name of the mite. It's an eight-legged um, arachnid. It's the same family as ticks and spiders. Um, Droll was unknown in the U.S. until about 1986 or 87 when it arrived here. Probably came in on bees that were brought in from other countries. It's pretty much a worldwide problem now with Australia being the only area that is free of droll at this point. Um, it spread quickly across the whole country and I think is the most serious health problem that bees are dealing with today. Um, it, a little bit of the history, Varroa initially was a parasite of Apis serrana, which is the Asiatic honeybee, and Varroa and serrana coexisted together pretty, pretty happily. The difference is serrana the development time for brood is a couple days less, which means that the number of mites that can be produced with serrana is far fewer, so that the mite levels don't get as high and it doesn't cause nearly as much of a problem. So that the big thing that allowed Varroa to make this jump was it figured out how to reproduce in worker brood. In Serrana, it's only the drone brood, but in our Apis mellifera, it is reproducing in worker brood also. That development time is two days longer, so that it is successful even in even worker brood with our Western honeybee Apis mellifera. Can you talk about how how Varroa actually does reproduce and why those yeah. those days matter? Sure, sure. That, that's real important. Reproduction in mites happens in the brood and the female mite goes into brood cells at the time the larva is about mature, at, at the time of capping. So it's able to hide in there once the capping is in place. The first egg laid is a male, which will form, form a, a male mite. Subsequent, that happens about 60 hours after um, capping. And then after each 30 hours after that, another egg is laid. All the subsequent eggs are females. So that by the time the pupa matures and is ready to emerge as an adult bee, you're going to have the original female mite called the foundress mite and one or two mature females. They've already been bred because they mate with their brother. Um, any of the mites that are not fully mature at the time the bee comes out of the cell die. It's only the matures that will survive. But those matures that do survive have already been mated, so they are now capable of, of reproduction. The original foundress will go back into another cell as will the mature daughters that are produced. In workers, you're going to get, on average, 21 days development time. Um, you're going to get between one and three mites produced. That's why drone brood is preferred for reproduction. Drone brood takes 25 days. There's that additional three or four days, which are going to allow two or three additional mites to be so that the efficiency of reproduction um, in drone brood is much higher because of that extra time. And that's why the mites have evolved to prefer drone brood rather than worker brood. But they are successful in worker brood. This is important because in periods where there's no brood being produced, there's no mite reproduction that can go on. So mite levels in the hive are going to stay the same or even drop down as some mites die. Um, this is opposed to areas where the warm climate, if there's brood production year-round, then there will be mite reproduction. Those levels are going to go up much more quickly. What is the lifespan of a mite? Like when, so during that break, you know, 
I've heard ticks can live for like three years. Is yeah, it a long yeah. I, I, that's a good question. I really don't have an exam, an exact answer. It's, it's a much different situation with ticks. Ticks have a two year life cycle. Mites, their life cycle is much shorter. Um, and I think they live some number of months, not years. Um, but in areas with Ruger and year round, mite reproduction goes on. What's happening is mite levels get to a critical point and then start causing severe problems with the colony in general. Now these problems are a result of the mites method of feeding. The adult mites feed on hemolymph or bee blood and the thought is they will um, bite a bee, get a meal, then they'll go to another bee. In doing so they spread viruses and this is the real thing that has made mites a huge problem mites have resulted in the viruses, which have always been present in bee colonies, becoming much more virulent and much more harmful. And the thought is because, in general, um, virus infections in bees, the infection occurred by the oral route, you know, larvae being fed by nurse bees. It takes many, many virus particles to cause an infection. Now we've got um, transfer via the, the biting. It, it's basically an intravenous transmission and the number of virus particles to infect a bee has gone way, way down. The other thing that by this new route of infection, we have selected for viruses that are much more virulent, much more harmful so that viruses are huge problem now as a result of varroa. And the varroa of itself, you know, at first we talked in terms of counting a hundred mites and, you know, the action level might have been 75 or something like that. That level has dropped now. I'm talking about a count on a, um, on a varroa tray. We're concerned if that level is over that's because of the viruses. The viruses are much more virulent and it takes not many mites to transfer these viruses. The, the colonies are basically getting sick from viral infection, but those infections are the result of, of viral mites. Can you talk about um, also how the viruses, it seems like the varroa and deformed wing in particular are working in tandem to spread each other. I was reading Right. Dirt right. periods. Yeah. Um, let's see. So that might spread spread viral infections in in one of and there's a couple different ways. One way is vertical transmission, and that means from a colony to its offspring. In other words, through swarming. Um, the viruses go from one colony to the swarm, they call it the daughter colony. The other thing that is a huge concern, and we think that this is a significant factor, is what we're calling horizontal transmission. Horizontal transmission basically doesn't mean from parent to offspring, as in swarming, but from one hive to another hive. This can happen couple different ways. It happens with drifting of bees, you know, bees not getting back to the same colony they left from, bringing their viruses and bringing mites that way. The other thing we think is happening is absconding. Colonies, when they get heavily infected with varroa and with high levels of viruses, and this is the, what we are calling the parasitic mite syndrome, we think that we're getting horizontal transmission there also. These colonies will abscond. And absconding, in my mind, is a hopeless form of swarming. It's a colony that leaves because things are just so bad to stay, so bad that they cannot stay. What we think is happening is that these absconding bees 
are moving into other hives and bringing with them the viruses and mites that they were trying to get away from. So this is the reason that in an ideal world, colonies are going to be placed far enough apart that these the drifting is going to be minimized and even um, be having other hives to move into as they abscond is also going to be real low. This is Tom Seeley's work in the swarms that he studied in the Arnold Forest before Varroa when he measured populations there he was finding about one colony per square mile. He came back post Varroa I think in about 2000 or, or later expecting that the feral colonies would be gone and did another survey of that same area found that it was about the same number of colonies Looking at um, DNA and genetics of the colonies, he found that there were some major changes. A lot of the strains, he, fortunately he had bees saved from the initial survey, so he was able to look at the um, genetics, the DNA composition of the colonies pre-Varroa and after Varroa, found that there was a, a real bottleneck, a lot of the strains of bees or a lot of the DNA representations were gone in the bees after Varroa, but yet they were still surviving pretty well. So the two things happened. Some of the most susceptible strains of bees were wiped out, but strains that did survive you know, seemed to be doing quite well. Not to say that you could take those colonies and put them in a bee yard with 30 other colonies and survive. Because one of the big advantages that these feral colonies have is they're being spread out. You know, the absconding bees moving into a hive when there's only one per square mile is pretty unlikely. As opposed to 30 colonies in one yard, that's going to be much more likely. I think the significance of this absconding is we like to monitor for feral levels and keep them under control. And usually we think in terms of if we get to mid-September, we're kind of home free. You know, brewering is going down, meaning mite reproduction is also going down, but we're seeing large jumps in varroa numbers in that time period. We think this is from drifting and absconding of colonies that are collapsing. So the significance of this is the varroa levels in your colonies not only are affecting your other colonies, they may be affecting other colonies around you due to this whole absconding situation that we're seeing in the fall or whenever colonies are collapsing from high parole levels. And in addition to the absconding, I would read robbing, a similar thing. Sure. Colonies are sure. Absolutely. They're kind of collapsing right. Right, right. in a dearth, and so robbers come in and just carry. Yeah, yeah. Dearth or colonies that are collapsing from high row levels are going to be susceptible to robbing. And those robbers are going to bring home honey, they're going to bring home feral mites, and they're going to bring home viruses. So that another reason to keep your colonies as healthy as possible. So to that end, um, how, what, what is the protocol for managing Varroa, the integrated management system? And how necessary is it? And um, I guess we'll answer those two questions. Okay, okay. I, I think monitoring mite levels is essential. Um, it's only through knowing the levels in the hive that we're going to get an idea when intervention is possible. And there's lots and lots of things you can do to, in addition to treatments, to keeping overall under control. But the basis of all of these is monitoring varroa levels. Several different ways to do it. One that we talk about a lot, particularly with the beginners classes and everything, are using the varroa tray underneath the screen bottom board. And the number that we talk about as far as an action level is when we see that get to above 10 or so mites. 
dropping off an undisturbed hive in 24 hours. That's important. If you go in and work the hive, more mites are going to drop off, and that number may be artificially elevated. It has to be, and the, the beauty of the Varroa tray is that you don't have to go into the hive. You pull your tray out, clean it up, maybe put some um, cooking oil or something on it so the mites that fall are going to stay in place. Then you just come back in 24 hours and count the mites. You can wait longer than that. It gets more difficult to count because there's also going to be debris and things falling on the tray. So we recommend 24 hours, but if you want to go 48, that's fine. And the number we're talking about is how many mites are falling in 24 hours. So if you check it after 48 hours, you're going to divide your number by two to determine where you are. Now, the limitations of a natural mite drop, which is what we're measuring, is it's proportional to the size of the colony. If you've got a little tiny colony, and 10 mites drop off, that could be a much more severe infection than if you have a really strong colony in two or three or four boxes. Now your mites per bee is going to be much lower and you still have that count of 10. The reason we like it though is it's something people can do. And people are some people are intimidated by having to go into the hive worrying about finding the queen, not sampling her in your, in your sample of bees, so that the monitoring using the tray isn't perfect, but it's easy, and trends are still significant. If you were to do that every two weeks, you found six mites, six mites, next time 12, it's telling you that things are changing and you better, better do something. The other methods that we use for counting mites are um, either a powdered sugar shake or an alcohol wash. The difference between the two, the sugar shake, you're not killing the bees. You can put the bees back afterwards. The alcohol does kill the bees. A lot of people choose to look at it as similar to having a blood sample drawn on you. You know, when you have a blood sample drawn, you've got live cells that are given their lives to get information. An alcohol wash is, is not much different than that. A small sample of the whole organism for the benefit of the whole organism. It's, and it, it's whatever people are comfortable with. Both of those work well. The advantage of those is it does give you an absolute number. It gives you a percent infection. In other words, how many mites are on each hundred bees. And typically we're using a half cup sample, which is about 300 bees, so that the number we get is then divided by three to give you the percent infection. There's some debate about whether you get as many mites off a sugar shake as you do an alcohol wash, some people are saying you should probably bump up the results you get with sugar by 20 to 40 percent um, to make it equivalent of alcohol. And the number that we feel there, and this is another one that has dropped a lot, we're concerned if that level is much above one and a half percent, meaning one or two mites per hundred is where we get concerned. So you're counting 300, if you're above between four and six, then you're, you're too high and you may well need to go in there. What about, um, I hear a lot from people, well, I look at my bees and I don't see the mites. Yeah, we used to have a picture in the beginner's class of a bee with three mites on it. It's a horrible picture because you're never gonna see it. If you are trying to determine your mite level by looking for mites on adult bees, you're going to fail because you will not see them. Lots and lots of people have said, I've never seen a mite on a bee. We've had people bring dead hives in, mystified why they died, and you look on the tray and there were hundreds or thousands of mites. They had never seen one. So as far as trying to observe mites on adult bees, 
forget it. You're not gonna gonna see. You you may see one, but you're not gonna have a clue what that level represents. The other way that some people use, and it's certainly better than trying to look at mites on adult workers, is by using capping for using it to pull drone pupae out. Mites reproduce preferentially in drone brood, and the number of mites you see in drone brood is an indication. How accurate it is, again, we don't know. And how to correlate that with a, an alcohol wash or sugar shake, we really don't have that. But if you go through 100 drone pupae and find no mites, that's significant. The hard part is what is significant. Is it 6? Is it 12? And we really don't know. But as far as a down and dirty quick method, it's certainly got some value. It's amazing. Um, so what are treatment? I mean, what are the options for treatment? What do we recommend? What are the seasonal okay. parameters? Okay. Lots of treatment methods. The, the methods that probably should be talked about first are those that are least invasive, you know, least dependence on chemicals and particularly synthetic chemicals. And those would be things like drone brood trapping. Drone brood is preferentially used by the mites to, to reproduce. So that if we go into a hive, if we put drone comb in there and then remove it every three weeks, we are removing it before any um, of these drones are able to emerge. And by removing it and freezing it or you know, scraping it, we're removing all of those mites, and we're definitely having an effect on lowering the mite population in the hive. The other thing that will have significant effects on um, mite levels is splitting colonies. Um, there, there's, there's two things. The other thing that people talk about as far as reducing mite levels is a brood break. And it's easy to understand how the winter time, you know, two or three months without brood, is going to reduce mite levels. Some people are also saying that if you create an artificial brood break, meaning take the queen and confine her on one comb or something so she can't lay for three weeks or something like that, you're going to have a broodless period. I'm not real comfortable with that one. A couple reasons. I'm not sure that it does the queen a lot of good to be confined in an area where she doesn't have enough room to lay for an extended period. The other thing that can happen in these hives, when you separate a queen from the rest of the brood, they often are going to think they're queens. And this is what we depend on when we raise queens. So by confining that queen on one comb, I think a lot of these colonies are going to produce queen cells, and it's going to require going back through the colony looking for queen cells before you re-release that queen. And really, if that queen is confined for three or four weeks, you're really going to have to reintroduce her into the hive with varying success. So I, I'm not wild about brood breaks. You're going to read about it quite a lot. I've got some concerns that it, it may have some issues. Your, the, the hive's productivity is also going to be impaired. The thing that works better, I think, is splitting hives or producing nukes. And doing this, if you're going to produce nukes with laying queens, you there really is no brood break because the new queen is going to start to produce brood right away. However, there's two things happening. There's no brood break, but if we take one hive and split it three ways, the absolute number of mites in each hive is greatly reduced. And what happens if we can reduce that starting point way down, you've got some more time before that level goes up to the point where it's actionable. So that, that's another method before we even talk about um, chemical treatments. 
So in that, you would um, you would split the colony and then introduce queens. Right. So right. really, what so you're getting three colonies for the price of one, kind right. of, right? And then requeening, but you're you're basically doing the same thing that you would do with like a mitre or something, where you're just knocking green numbers down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. We're knocking white numbers down, just like we're doing with the umbricals, but we've not used any. It also gives us the ability to, you know, get some new queens in there and, you know, maybe come up with you know, better genetics. And that's kind of the holy grail of this whole effort to, you know, to solve the rural problem is to come up with bees that are able to manage mites on their own. Can we talk about the, the chemical treatments? Sure. And then I would like to touch back on um, you know, on why, what characteristics queens have that make them more resistant to grow, like okay. how that works. Like okay, what? okay. All right, the treatment options, the chemical treatments options, there are options out there. There are quite a few. There are the, the natural products, we'll call them. There's kind of a couple groups there. There are the organic acids. One is formic acid, and the other is oxalic acid. Formic acid is approved by the organic beekeeping groups. There's no residue. It can be used with honey supers on. And it's the only one, well, the, of the acids that can be used that way. Oxalic acid has to be used without honey supers on. There's another natural product, which is um, a product of the hop plant. It's called Hop Guard. It's hop extract. That can be used in as long with honey supers on as long as it's only used in the brood nest. The of these products, the formic acid product is the only one that will have some effect on the mites, what we call the reproductive mites, those mites that are sealed in the brood. The other treatments have an effect only on the adult mites on the workers, those are called phoretic mites. And that's true of oxalic acid, it's true of the hop guard product, and it's also true of the other synthetic products that we'll talk about. All of these products, you really have to read the label. There are temperature restrictions where it's going to be more effective, and with formic acid in particular, high temperatures, it's going to be harder on the bees. There's going to be some queen loss. There are going to be more bee losses if it's done at higher temperatures. So for all of the mite treatments, you absolutely have to read the label. They've all got some nuances, what the dose is, where you put the dose, when you do it, whether you need to repeat it, and it's way too much to try to give you all that information. You've got to read the label and follow the directions with it. And that also applies to the safety hazards when they say to wear gloves, you really do need to wear gloves. And with the mite treatments, gloves means a rubber glove or a nitrile glove. Your leather beekeeping gloves are not going to protect you from these acids. So that you have to wear, wear rubber or nitrile gloves for those. And respirators. Yeah. The respirator needs to be used with oxalic acid if it's used it with a vaporizer. If you're going to use oxalic acid by the dribble methods, you should wear eye protection, but a respirator is not necessary. They used to recommend a respirator for the mitoid quick strips, the formic acid product. That recommendation has been pulled. You don't want to see what it smells like, but the respirator is not, not needed. But with the vaporization of oxalic acid, you absolutely want to use it. It is nasty stuff. And you really, really should use a respirator. And it wants to be a respirator with an organic acid vapor filter. So a specific respirator, not just a paint filter, not just a surgeon mask. It's not going to help you. Okay, specific respirator. Right, right, yeah. Um, so for a year, like, what would you, like, say starting in the fall? It's September. You want to get your bee, you know. Okay. Okay. How, what are you going to do? Right. With if we're going to start in September, we're going to assume we've managed the summer so that our, our mite levels are below that action point. 
below, say, 1.5%, I would love to have you check them again about the 1st of October to be sure that that level hasn't jumped back up. And remember, that's due to robbing, drifting, and absconding from colonies that are in, in trouble from growth. If that level is up, the late fall is an ideal time to use exhaled gases. The temperature, there are, there are really few temperature restrictions, works well in brewless periods, and you can either go with a dribble of oxalic acid and sugar syrup or a vaporization treatment pretty late. And it wants to be probably the latter half of September. A lot of people are doing it as late as Thanksgiving. The reason you're broodless at that point and you're going to get good effectiveness um, because there are not any or not many mites in the brood. And that's going to really hold you until spring. I think if you do that in the fall, you probably want to start monitoring, say, late April or May. Chances are pretty good that you're not going to have to treat, but you're going to want to monitor throughout the summer. Odds are on overwintered colonies, by the time we get into August, you're going to see those levels going up. And depending on what else you're doing, and you may need to do that first treatment in July or August. And you might need to do it in June. Everybody's area is different. You know, we've got good beekeepers that do not have mites. It's because they did a good job with mite control and they're in an area where their colonies are not getting infected. That's not going to be the case, particularly if you've got um, commercial beekeepers moving in from the south. You, know, you may see your mite levels bumping up in June. So when you're going to need to intervene is going to depend on what your mite levels are rather than a calendar. And you, you can't do it with a calendar, but you're going to want to start monitoring by May and be prepared to treat when that level goes up. So what's the future? Like what, you know, what's going to happen? Well, I, the, the future is, I, I guess I'm kind of optimistic. There's a lot of work that's being done with breeding. There's a couple different methods or mechanisms that we're trying to um, select for that make bees more resistant to feral mites. There are at least three, if not four, different ones. One is something called VSH or varroa sensitive hygiene. These are bees that can recognize brood that has varroa in it. They will uncap that brood, remove those pupae and the mites, get it out of the hive, and literally lower the number of reproductive mites. Um, there's another trait called hygienic behavior. Now, hygienic behavior, there's some debate about what that means and what it selects for, and it's not selecting specifically for mite resistance. The, um, hygienic behavior was first developed as a means of helping bees to deal with a problem that we had before viral mites, and that's American fowl root. And they were quite successful in you know, developing strains that really could keep AFB under control. As varroa became such a huge problem, those selection criteria were gone, but we do find that VSH bees with this trait, excuse me, hygienic behavior bees with this trait will do a better job with varroa mice. There's also bees that have more develop grooming behavior, they groom themselves, they groom other bees, and literally physically remove mites. There's also some selection that's going on for bees that are actively trying to kill mites. And there's a group in Ohio that's working with this. It's the Ohio Ankle Biter um, program. What they're doing is they are looking at the mites on the trays and looking for mites that are missing legs, missing parts of their, their body, and selecting for these queens. 
and there's there's some success there. There's the whole Russian program, and the Russians use kind of all of these techniques and probably some more that we don't understand to keep much under control. Then the final strategy that is being very successfully used is by the Africanized natives. They have the same strategy that Apisarana, the Asiatic honeybee, does, and that's shorter brood cycles. The worker brood is more like 19 and a half or 20 days, so that the efficiency of mite reproduction goes way, way down. And if the mites aren't successfully reproducing, if they're not producing one and a half or two mites per adult that goes in, then those levels are going to go up very, very slowly. And it's not going to be nearly the problem that we have currently. So lots of different methods being looked at. Is it possible then that we would kind of move away from the Western honeybee and start using other bees? I don't think so, and I hope not. Because anytime we've introduced something, we have created